Hi class, this is Ms. Sheely with today's first set of notes for our Chapter 4, Ecology. Um, this set of notes is actually pretty short and it's going to cover both 4.1 and 4.2. So we're going to start with 4.1, which is Species, Communities, and Ecosystem. Alright, so first we need to understand what ecology is. Ecology is the study of relationships between living organisms and between organisms and their environment. So it's really the two factors. So if let's start kind of big and work our way down so you start with an ecosystem well an ecosystem is a community and it's abiotic or non-living environment well, what's a community a community is a group of populations that's living and interacting with each other in an area um, that area would be the habitat of each species well, what is a population? A population is a group of organisms of the same species living in the same area at the same time. Well, back up even further, what's a species? A species is a group of organisms that can interbreed to produce fertile offspring. Do note that species can be reproductively isolated, so they can be separated by a barrier, but still be of the same species, because they can, if they, they could get together, they could interbreed and produce fertile offspring. The address where that species lives is its habitat, or the environment in which it lives, the location of where it lives. So, you take species and you get several species together in one area and that's a population. You take that population and you add other populations interacting with each other and that becomes a community. You take the abiotic or non-living environment around the community and add that into the fold and then we have our ecosystem. And when you look at all of these relationships, that's ecology. So there are different ways of organisms feeding themselves. You have two main um, ways. You have autotrophy, or self-feeding, and a heterotrophy, or other source feeding, not feeding on self. Um, autotrophs are typically organisms that produce their own food from organic molecules. And you have two different um, types of autotrophs. Um, all autotrophs are typically called producers. The two main types of autotrophs or producers are photoautotrophs or chemoautotrophs. Uh, we mainly study photoautotrophs when we're studying biology because we're looking at that photosynthesis part. Um, examples of this would be any type of green plant and any type of phytoplankton and algae. But we also have chemoautotrophs, and these would be organisms that do chemosynthesis or make their food products out of chemicals. And these would be deep sea chemosynthetic bacteria, um, any type of bacteria that lives in hydrothermal vents or just deep in the sea where they don't have access to the sunlight. So those are your main two types of producers or autotrophs. Looking at the other side, the opposite side, we have heterotrophs. And these are organisms which get their energy from other living things. They cannot make their own food. And you have two main branches of heterotrophs. You have consumers and decomposers. Consumers are going to ingest the organic material which is living or recently killed. So this would be um, herbivores, carnivores, or omnivores. So you have primary consumers, which would eat producers. That would be our herbivore. Or secondary uh, consumers, which would eat other consumers, such they would be carnivores um, or omnivores that eat both producers and uh, other consumers. A decomposer, on the other hand, gets its energy from non-living organic matter. And you have two main types. And this is really where we get into some perhaps new material for you. We have detrivores and saprotrophs. Detrivores are going to ingest non-living organic matter, earthworms and wood lice. Saprotrophs are correct name for bacteria and fungi. Saprotrophs are going to live on or in non-living organic matter, and they're going to secrete digestive enzymes into that organic matter and then uh, absorb those digestive products. So that would, like I said, be your bacteria and your fungi. So these are, we're going to go into these a little bit more in the next couple slides. So again, a detrivore, this would be something that ingests non-living organic matter first 
so you eat it first, then it's digested. Okay. Um, one of Darwin's great and final works was the long-term study of how earthworms produce soil through their feeding, and that was published in 1881. So we've been looking at um, detrivores for a very long time. It's also a great um, picture of a wood louse, and if you would like to see a giant Gippsland earthworm, um, you can access this YouTube video here through the PowerPoint. Sabotrophs, uh, they live, like I said, in or on non-living organic matter, but the big thing is that they digest first and then absorb, and these are, are really important to our ecosystem as they are the organisms that typically help recycle the nutrients within the ecosystem. So, autotrophs and heterotrophs all have to obtain inorganic nutrients from the abiotic environment. So whether they're a producer, a consumer, or even a decomposer, they have a need for nutrients. And there are, if you remember this bottom part here, many elements occur frequently in living organisms that are of use in metabolic processes. Our main four, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen, but you also have phosphorus, sulfur, and about 14 others such as iron and manganese and potassium and calcium. Um, all of these are necessary for our metabolic processes. So producers will take in, um, take simple inorganic molecules and make our complex organic molecules. Our consumers will then consume those complex organic molecules and our decomposers will break those complex organic molecules back into the simple ones so that they can be recycled back through the earth, through the ecosystem. All right, so like I just said, nutrients are cycled throughout the ecosystem. So you do have the energy coming in from the sun, but you have all those nutrients moving between plants and um, herbivores, detrivores, between the soil and the abiotic environment, as well as the atmosphere and abiotic environment as well. Something to note is that energy cannot be recycled throughout the ecosystem. So the sustainability of the ecosystem or the system that you're looking at is very dependent on a constant energy supply. And we're actually going to make something called a mesocosm um, that will be able to see and hopefully um, get a sustainable system um, ongoing. All right, so that was it with 4.1. Um, super short today. Our second topic is 4.2, which is energy flow. All right, so our first key point is that sunlight is the initial energy source for almost all communities. So we did talk about how there are some chemoautotrophs that do not use energy uh, from the sun. They are able to use chemicals. But our energy will flow through the food chain and it will be lost at each stage due to respiration and all of our nutrients are recycled. So you have your energy starting with the sun going into our producers, some is lost to heat, some of that energy goes on to the consumers, consumers lose some of it is to heat, consumers can pass energy on to decomposers, look, decomposers lose heat, and then producers can also pass some energy to decomposers as well. The blue arrow is the nutrients. So you can see we have nutrients starting in an inorganic nutrient pool taken out by the producers, either given to the consumers or the decomposers. The consumers can pass to the decomposers, but however they end up here, they'll go back to the inorganic nutrient pool through the decomposers. All right, so consumers ingest organic matter, um, which was recently living or recently killed, and food chain is going to show the flow of energy through what we call trophic levels of a feeding relationship. So what the world is the trophic level? That's just the feeding position of an organism in a food chain. So you start at the bottom of the food chain, and you have your producer. That's going to be our trophic level. So here you have um, several different examples. You have a yellow iris. You have something called a diatom or phytoplankton. The producer is eaten by a primary consumer. That primary consumer, if it's eating a producer, is going to be called an herbivore. Your primary consumer is your uh, trophic level. In this case, the moth caterpillar is going to eat the yellow iris. Or the krill is going to eat the diatom. Or the freshwater shrimp is going to eat the phytoplankton. 
Your third trophic level is going to be your secondary consumers. These would be your carnivores or omnivores. In this case, you have it being a carnivore. This great tit bird is going to eat the moth caterpillar. The moth caterpillar would have gotten its energy from the yellow iris. Your fourth trophic level in this area is your tertiary consumer. Um, whatever this is, your top, your final stage, this is your top carnivore. Typically, most food chains um, cannot sustain more than a tertiary consumer, although there are exceptions. Um, in our woodland area, we have our great tit being eaten by a sparrow hawk. So as you can see, the energy is moving from what is being eaten to what is doing the eating. So it's really important that you get these areas flowing um, in the right direction because the arrows represent the energy flow. So that was a food chain. Food webs are a little bit more uh, correct as they show all of the feeding relationships within a habitat. So food webs just contain many food chains. So take a look, I take a second to look at this food web and can you pick out a three-step food chain? What about a four-step food chain? All right, so my three-step food chain would be the phytoplankton, the sea whip, to a reef shark. There are several over here. You could have done the exact same thing, but having the parrotfish in the middle or going from phytoplankton, parrotfish, to snapper, um, just as long as you're going in the order of the arrows. For my four-step food chain, I'm going to start with the algae. I'm going to go to the didarma and then the marine omnivores and then the groupers. So it's very easy to see that you can have um, multiple feeding relationships within a food web. There are some organisms that fit into more than one trophic level. Take a second to look at this food web and see if you can come up with at least two examples from this web. Who is at different? levels, different trophic levels on this food chain, food web. All right, so um, two main examples are snappers and our reef sharks. Both of these organisms can be either secondary or ter tertiary consumer, depending on the food source that you're looking at before it. Um, so your snapper, um, if you're going phytoplankton, parrotfish, snapper, that would be a secondary consumer, but how could you be a tertiary consumer? Well, if it's going phytoplankton, marine invertebrate, marine omnivore, and then to the snapper. So that's how that works. So what is a pyramid of energy? It's just a visual representation that shows the energy flow um, between trophic levels. It is measured in units of energy per unit area per unit time. So this is kilojoules, our unit of energy, per meter squared per year. And these negatives just mean that you could have written them um, underneath uh, instead of all in one line. Do remember that the transfer of energy is never 100% efficient. We, locked, we looked at recently how there is heat lost at every energy passing from one organism to the next. It's actually about 90% of energy that's lost between trophic levels. It's lost because it's just not ingested. Think about all the stuff that you poop out um, it's, so that's not digested or assimilated, it is excreted, or it could just be lost as heat from respiration or other metabolic reactions. So our bottom of our pyramid of energy is our producers, then our consumers, then our secondary consumers, and then our tertiary consumers. So if you start with a thousand kilojoules per meter square per year, only 10% of the energy is going to go up to the next level. So that would be a hundred kilojoules per meter squared per year. Again, only 10% goes up to the next level. So we're now from 100 to 10, and then finally from 10 to 1. So because that 90% of energy is lost, only 10% of energy can go to the next trophic level. We'll do some work with uh, energy pyramids next week, uh, so you can see exactly what you need to take into consideration if you ever have to draw these. Hint, hint. 
All right, so energy flows and nutrients are recycled. This is kind of our big overall theme of these two sections. So energy enters from sunlight. The autotrophs capture the sunlight, and the energy flows through the trophic levels of the steps in the food chain. That energy transfer is only approximately 10% because of the energy lost due to material not being consumed or assimilated, egested, or excreted. Egested is just another way of saying digested. The energy then passes to the decomposers, the detrovores, the saprotrophs, in dead organic matter. Heat energy is lost through cell respiration. Nutrients, however, are cycled within the ecosystem or recycled. They can also come from the weathering of rocks. That's how they enter the ecosystem. They're recycled from the decomposition of dead organisms. They move through the food chain by the digestion of organisms. And nutrients are absorbed by producers, plants, roots. And they are lost by leaching or sedimentation. So think about seashells sea sinking to the sea bed. We get a lot of calcium carbonate that way. All right, and that's actually it for 4.1 and 4.2. Thanks so much. Get ready for lots of labs.